are here to talk about the mysteries based on a new course that's being developed. Thanks to Derek. Oh, thanks to you for doing it. So I've started an online course, uh, if you will, side of things, MVP courses. This particular course, we go through seven versions of the mystery cults. I call it mystery religion, I think, in the title. But the, the you actually cover that in the course as well. Yep. And we go into everything. Of course, we save the best for last, meaning we deal with Christianity as a mystery cult. And you, I'm, I'm sitting over here listening while you're talking. And I'm just thinking to myself, there are so many interesting ideas that were floating around at this period. Definitely. And so I just want people to know, be on the lookout. You can purchase the course. It'll be a lifetime course. You can always watch it again. But for those of you who are on a spiritual journey and you're looking for deeper insights and understandings of things like this, that's an option. For those of you who are looking for kind of a tool, a weapon, a shield, whatever, against apologetics, this will be obviously handy with a lot of material. So it's really for like whatever you are interested in, it is going to be educational material either way. And you're going to be able to see this is what really was the revelation for me. I was telling you last night. While it doesn't debunk necessarily, because some people like Justin Martyr had no problem with looking at all the mystery cults and saying, well, ours is the true one, but uh, the Satan knew way beforehand, yada, yada, yada. For me, it, it, it did me in. It did me in to say, oh my goodness, like there is so much of this stuff going on by non-Christian groups that it was enough for me to go like, why do I have a double standard and think mine's true and everyone else is wrong? So at the very least, I started to expand and think, what if God's trying to reveal himself or itself through everything? That was my deconversion process. So I thought maybe there's truth in all of this. And they're all trying to touch the elephant, but they're all blind like the six wise men at Hindu stands. You know the poem, I'm sure. So I was like, okay, maybe we're trying to understand this thing that we can't get. And that's where I went through my process. Now I'm like, Maybe you might say I'm a little too critical sometimes, but I don't know. But you can never be too critical, but uh, you you can, yeah, go a little bit off the rails. I would say comparison is, yeah, it's redemptive. And when you learn how to compare well and in the course, uh, you know, it's an academic course. It's something that's in-depth, something that's researched, not something that you're going to traditionally find for free on the internet. This mm. is something that you would get at a university as a kind of intro course to the mystery cults of the, of the ancient world. So that's what you're getting. And you're also along the way, you are learning how to compare in a sophisticated, non-apologetic way. And what I mean by that is you're learning to compare in a way that you're not starting with an idea or a dogmatic idea and then looking for evidence to go prove what you already believe. Mm -hmm. You are actually just looking at the evidence because it's, it's interesting and informative and I would say redemptive. And then based on that, you're making your, your own conclusions about truth or whatever it is that you've come to learn right. for. I just want to give a shout out to, to Jason Sobeck, Lord of the Four Corners. This is, is this Greek? This looks like it might be. Yes, he is uh, initiated on the third day or perfected. What's important for me in, in giving this course is that you you go the, the extra step. And this is a way for me as a, as a scholar to make contact with all you folks out there and actually transmit some of the the really uh, the good stuff that is the well the well researched stuff, and the also the latest research stuff not not the hackneyed cliched stuff, uh, but the stuff that has some real evidentiary value, and then get it giving you f suggestions for further reading so you can take you can take this as far as you want to go okay. And I tell you where where to go, uh, because honestly, today with so much information, it's hard to know exactly where to go. Uh, but 
I give you that further reading list and um, happy if you want to join my Patreon. Mm. What we're going to do is that's a great way to yeah access direct uh, questions of uh, you know that I will uh, get to whenever I can. And uh, so that's that's it. Um, and yeah, I I think that I, I would encourage everybody to to take the opportunity to. Yeah, really make the effort and to learn learn more um, mm -hmm. and and go the extra mile. You did traverse the planet and got all the way here in person from Australia. We made this happen. And so what do you offer here? So the Patreon is it's it offers two full courses currently. Uh, it's going to be on. Well, in addition to all the other kind of podcasts that I've done, it offers two full courses on all of the, the Gnostic and Nagamati texts and on the uh, Found Christianities, which is a book that Derek recently got, just came out in 2022. Uh, and this book, I go through all those figures that have been heretical,ized and um, sort of marginalized in the Christian tradition. And I go through and tell you, yeah, what they thought, what they did, what they believed, so on and so forth. So, and again, those are academic courses that are on top of all of the, the all the podcasts that I've done, which is mm -hmm. now quite a lot. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, must get. Uh, have you heard any feedback about this book at all from any other academics? Have any of them been critical of it or said, hey, you know, I don't. Well, I was just in Chicago and I uh, heard a plenary lecture by Paula Fredrickson and she she highly recommended it. <laughs> really? <laughs> so good. Well, that's uh, good news. Someone of her caliber, if any of your viewers are familiar with her work, she's also very accessible with lots of popular uh, books and so yeah, I, she likes it so far <laughs> because you really can't just do the New Testament mm -hmm. because the New Testament is invented, you know, centuries after. So you've got to understand those later centuries, the second, the third, the fourth century to understand what is the New Testament. Because if you're thinking that it's a, you know, first century product like Christianity, you know, appeared and was fully complete in the first century, it's just not true. And so you got to know it all. I think for many, the major kind of criteria is the destruction of the second temple. Mm -hmm. And that's in 70. And this is a sort of, this isn't for Jews. This was an event, event that's more important than 9-11 is for Americans. This is the destruction of their most important sacred building uh, by Roman armed forces, which totally changed the culture and the the religious scene. And I think it's fairly clear that the authentic Paul, by which I mean those seven letters uh, that are actually from him or mm -hmm. dictated by him, they have no idea or no clue about the destruction of the, the second temple. So that's a pretty good indication that he's living at least before 70. Now it's interesting that in, in, uh, in, in the Thessalonian letters, and uh, there is what we think is an interpolation uh, where- Judgment has come upon the Jews or something? Yes, where a person, supposedly Paul says that the wrath of God mm -hmm. has come upon them at last. And that sounds like it was written after 70, because what Christians did do is they said, you know, basically the destruction of the temple is a manifestation of the wrath of God against Jews because mm. they killed Jesus. That is according to Christian mythology. They would never agree with that. But so that could very well be written after 70. So. And this, even that is, I'm not saying it isn't the case, but even that's somewhat speculative because I've thought about other ways to rationalize this. And I thought Caligula was a thorn in the Jews' side. And, and there was the Jews being ex expelled from 
you know, the region made me think, okay, could this be counted in Paul's mind as here's some judgment? I mean, they're being t removed from the land or removed from the locations that they were in. I'm not saying that <laughs> that's the case, but you yeah, see what I'm trying to say? There are the other worst, ways to explain it. Yeah, the worst that happened in 40, 41, I don't, I don't see any migration. In fact, the Jews viewed that as a tremendous uh, political success. Oh, really? Uh, Petronius, who was the Syrian governor, uh, was basically ended up on the Jewish side and wanted to delay the order to put Caligula's image in the Jerusalem temple. And then, lo and behold, Caligula was, was killed. So the worst that happened in that, in that year of 4041 was that the, uh, the grain fields weren't sown. And so there was a food shortage later on, which uh, Paul is aware of. But it, in fact, that, that incident with Caligula, yes, it caused extreme terror among the Jewish aristocracy and among the Jewish people yeah. because they didn't want an image in the temple, but they won because an image was never put in the temple and Caligula was murdered. A couple of super chats and one of them is actually in the question of what I was going to bring up that I think is interesting. Stop scamming, man. Thank you for the support, my friend. I really do appreciate it. Does Mark portray Jesus as initially out of his depth, reacting with anger, bad crowd control, wardrobe malfunction with his magic robe? <laughs> That's a great way to put it. Um, yeah, I, I think the depiction of Jesus in Mark is, uh, I mean, in some ways it's pretty raw. Uh, and there's this great manuscript variation where Jesus is touched <clears throat> by the uh, leper and it says that he, the manuscript reading is that he, he turned around and snorted in anger in response, <laughs> in response to this. Now this doesn't end up in many English versions, but yeah, you have a very raw sense of, of Jesus. Um, he does get angry. Uh, he does uh, seem a little bit uh, aloof and a little bit rude. I mean, he calls Peter, you know, names. And so it's, it's, it's not only the disciples that appear a little bit dumb in Mark, it's, it's Jesus who appears very rough around the edges. This doesn't necessarily mean that it's more historical, but I think that it, it does, it does indicate that uh, Jesus is, he's not, you know, what some Christians take him to be, which is sort of like, you know, almost floating on earth in this, you know, divine peace yeah. and contemplation. Uh, he is, he is rough and uh, harsh and he's a difficult teacher and shows a lot of tough love. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> Greco Roman gods are often fairly harsh. Um, I mean, Jesus famously tells the Syrophoenician women, woman that, uh, you know, she, he compares her with a little dog um, and that, that really has rubbed people uh, the wrong way. Mm -hmm. um, and that's true. It, it should. But then the question is, yeah, how does the son of God react? Well, you know, this isn't namby-pamby stuff. A, a son of God in the Greco-Roman world can be really harsh and mm -hmm. also kill people if he gets upset. So you can read, uh, yeah, chapter two of Jesus Deus, where I go into oh. Jesus as a child who... Um, actually is recorded to have killed several fellow children and adults when he got a little bit pissed off. I mean, the thing with deification is, yes, in the Eastern and Russian Orthodox uh, churches, they promote deification as an idea, but it is an idea which they say, you know, you never get over the creator-creature distinction, that you always remain a creature even though you're deified. And I think in the early period with Paul, that wasn't the case. Mm. You, you, there, the divine is a spectrum. So you can become a lesser, a lesser God because a God is defined as, as a being with immortality and superhuman power. And that's what redeemed Christians become. So it's totally fine to call them gods. And it's totally think that totally fine to think that they undergo real ontological change that is bodily change to become a superhuman, uh, actually a superhuman figure.
Any idea who or what sort of villain Paul's man of sin is? Have you taken a jab at that? Because I know it's speculation land. Yeah, well, you know, it's not necessarily the, the Antichrist. Uh, you know, Paul never uses that term. Uh, that term is invented later. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, so Paul has lived through what we were talking about earlier, this big scare with Caligula, where the Roman emperor just out of vengeance, uh, basically wanted to put his image in the Jerusalem temple because he thought that, you know, the God that the Jews worship is just a form of Zeus. And since the emperor <clears throat> is a manifestation of Zeus on earth, it's completely logical to put his image in the temple. Of course, most Jews thought otherwise, not all of them, but this created a big, big scare. So a lot of, and that scare kind of continued, you know, like if you think of 9-11, that big, big scare of terrorism, mm -hmm. that, that continued, you know, and America continued to fear terrorist threats and still fears terrorist threats. So whatever Paul is thinking of, that, that really formed his conception. And so I think very possibly, yeah, it's an imperial figure who is like a more successful Caligula. Uh, and, and yeah, it's, it's an emperor who actually does succeed in more or less threatening the, the Jews and, and wreaking havoc on earth. But again, Paul, so, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a gesture toward Nero really. Uh, but we don't know if it is, if it was actually Nero. Hmm. I think anyone writing in the late sixties when the Jewish war was going on and in, and in, 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 in 70 and beyond, yeah, they could, you know, just like today where so-called wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes are taken as signs of greater cosmic events. I think Christians, yeah, were looking over their shoulder to Judea and thinking that this war, yeah, is a sign of a greater cosmic judgment and you know because it, it looked like if you were in the year 69 which is famously the year of four emperors you know imagine a single year just as a thought experiment imagine a single year in which there were four presidents because three of them got killed <laughs> that was the year of 69 for, wow. for the ancient romans you know in augustine or sorry augustus you know reigned for over 40 years but in 69 Nero puts a knife in his throat. Then Galba gets his head chopped off in the Roman marketplace, <laughs> you know? <laughs> then Otho kills himself after a battle in Northern Italy. Then Vitellius is thrown, uh, is, is murdered in the palace, you know, weeping and begging for his life and thrown down the stairs. And these are Roman emperors. These are the most powerful men on earth and this is why the jews thought they could win this because they thought the roman empire was tottering i mean they can't even have an emperor galba was only in office for just a few weeks before publicly getting his head chopped off i mean it, it's sort of like if you imagine the inauguration in 2021 with president biden and somebody behind him took a sword and chopped his head off. It, on it, and on, everyone saw it. On yeah. public television. Oh. I, mean, I mean, this was, you You would think, you know, revolution. Especially if you're religious minded, right? If you have kind of this idea of apocalypticism, it's over. Absolutely. You're going to say this is evidence. Right. So the, the eternal power of Rome in the year 69 looked like it was tottering, like a building just on the verge of collapse. So that was enough for these apocalyptic writers to go crazy and yeah to start thinking about cosmic judgment because once the roman empire falls then it's god's kingdom wow stop scamming man thank you so much for that super chat my friend i really do appreciate the support esoterica dr justin sledge good to see you here my friend and thank you for the super chat many thanks to professor litwa for his scholarship and for derek for his work making scholars accessible but it's just so everybody knows, teaser here, we have a seven-part series coming out, college course level stuff. We're going to edit it with visuals, the whole nine. You're going to have reading materials. 
you're going to learn a thing or two, I can tell you that. And we'll have those courses set up for purchase at some point once the edit's done and ready. So be on the lookout. It's on the mysteries, and the last mystery ends up being Christianity. It's so much fun. So yeah. much fun. Thank you so much. Did you want to say anything? Greco-Roman mysteries. Yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. just to list them, that we, we're going to cover the Samothracian mysteries, Eleusinian mysteries. We cover mysteries of Isis and Osiris. Orphic and Dionysian mysteries, as well as Attis and Sibylle, and Hermetic uh, mystery cult movements, and then on to, on to Christianity. So be on the lookout. It'll be exciting. I can promise you that. Thank you. Neophyte one in the house. Thank you so much for the super chat, my friend. Walter Burkhart. Uh, Burkhart described mystery cults as open systems analogous to Catholic devotions to Mary. He cites priests ordained in numerous mysteries and Mithraic sites with statues of other deities. Agree? Well, Walter Berker, uh, whom I mentioned in the, in the series, is, was the master of the Greek mysteries. And if you can get a hold of his book, Ancient Mystery Cults, published in the late 80s, but still absolutely wonderful, wonderful book. Highly recommend it. Uh, Walter Berker is great. Now, and, and his definition of the mysteries is, I'm not sure if he used the term open systems, but he thought that they were voluntary cult movements of a personal nature, which led people to a deeper experience of the sacred. And so with this definition in, in place, uh, you can have other movements like Christian cult groups performing all the functions of a Greco-Roman mystery. Uh, in, in the period from the first, second, third century, there's no Catholic with a capital C. Uh, they, don't, they don't have that kind of authority. Um, and the devotion to Mary is actually quite late in the game. Um, she only becomes really important uh, in the in the fourth century. But I, I think uh, I, I think it's totally fine to compare Christianity and some versions of Christianity, and thinking uh, especially of, of Gnostic Christianities, if you if you use that term, like the Nicene. Uh, Christian cult like the Aphites and uh, several other groups, Valentinians, Sethians, they were of this very personal nature and they did involve actual club secrets. Now that also is true of the early Catholics and the structure of early, early Catholics is also, you know, there are certain secrets or mysteries that they don't tell you on unless you're baptized, which is the Christian initiation. And so that structure of, of doing things does indicate that they were not only aware of the structure of mystery cults, where you only learn the secret after the initiation, but they also operated similar to a mystery cult on that structural level. Of course, for Christians, the, the content in the mysteries was different mm -hmm. and had to deal with their own sacred story. And in the course, we, we do some comparison of that sacred Christian story with the other sacred stories in, in the other mysteries. He goes into depth, like explaining the stories of whether it be Dionysus or whether it be Osiris or whatever. And it's really interesting. So I will be putting visuals, fingers crossed, we could put some good visuals to give people a way to gravitate through the courses. But yeah, sorry to interrupt. Definitely. Uh, yeah, for for Miss for Mithras, there's definitely priests, and there's seven seven levels of initiation, um, and so on, on a structural level, yeah, you have something which you could compare to later uh, structures uh, for ecclesial or church initiations, but of course, uh, yeah, there's the the myth itself is different, the sacred story is different, the iconography is different. So, uh, but yeah, if we're if you're looking at the structural level, you can definitely see a lot of similarities. Thank you. Appreciate that neophyte. I'd love to get into 
uh, Mithraism, I hear there's kind of this like we're limited on what we can and cannot you know know. Yeah, that's the difficulty with that one. But, of, of all the mystery cults, we're 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 struggling with with Mithraism because no actual documents survive of what the sacred tale was. All that survives are is is 99% of it is iconography, which is the familiar Tarakteni or Mithra slaying the bull episode. Mm -hmm. and, it, and if you're just looking at a picture, you don't know exactly what the sacred story behind the picture was. Got it. But the, uh, again, there's plenty of plenty of theories, but we, yeah. <laughs> you know, we don't have an insider to actually say. It's as if 2,000 years from now, the only thing that survived of Christianity the gospels were all lost and all that we had were crucifixes a guy on a cross a guy on a cross and then <clears throat> 2000 years later you had to start from scratch and say well what does this thing mean a guy on a cross and you might see like people below the cross a woman weeping and so what does this actually mean and yeah if you don't have the gospels text to help you understand what the sacred story is frankly you could come up with a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. I never really knew it like that. Now I did hear there there is underground chambers we can look at to kind of see how they would sit. We have some of the images, like you said, the bull, but also stars on the ceiling and things. Yep. So so that could be anything though. There's so many things you can make be from that, you know. Yeah, we have plenty of instances of of ancient Mithraeums, which are, which are these caves uh, from you know Rome to to even North England, we have Mithraic caves. Uh, so yeah, we, we can go inside some of these and check out what the actual, what the structure of the building was. But again, I mean, it, it's it's like, you know, 2000 years from now, Christianity is erased and all we have are a few churches. Mm. What do we interpret about the religion? Thank you, Neophyte. Had to rabbit trail into the Mithraic cults. Brute Facts Podcast, my buddy, Eddie. If you have not subscribed, Eddie, by the way, he's one of the few Christians I know who interviews people on the other side of the aisle more than he does Christians. So, okay. dude, <laughs> he's an awesome, awesome guy, and he's big into philosophy. So if you haven't subscribed, please go subscribe to my friend here. I love showing community. I don't care where you stand. At the end of the day, your ontology is yours, not mine, and it's not for me to sit here and tell you what you should think. Um, but he is one of the most friendly guys on the YouTube world when it, when it comes to Christianity, being a Christian. So please uh, go show him some love. He says, because you're an awesome human being. Well, you are too, my friend. Thank you for the super chat. Seriously. And um, I wish you could do more shows, man, but I know you work all the time. So I just want to say thank you for being here in the chat. I was getting my coffee earlier, actually coming here to meet up with Dr. Litwis. So I couldn't stick around for long, but I appreciate the plug, my friend. Thank you, Eddie. Oh, See how see how it just kicked me down? It does that. Uh, is it I how do you pronounce this? I don't want to butcher your name. Is it Missa Missai? Masse? Masse? Masia? Masia? Muslim. Thank you for the super chat. There is no denial that many have been portrayed as messiahs and gods, but Jesus' message of sharing and caring has been the driving force to man's current progress. Religion has been misused and abused. Would you want to comment? <laughs> well, it's certainly been misused and abused. Um, yeah, I, you know, I'm not sure that Jesus's message was sharing and, and caring. I mean, um, maybe part of it was, but if you believe, uh, Dale Allison and Jesus was also an apocalyptic prophet who was threatening people with judgment and, uh, talking about the end of the world. Um, he did heal people, but he also, uh, hurt some people. And I think, you know, it, it's fair to say that, you know, Jesus is, is pretty ambiguous, whether you're talking about the so-called historical Jesus or whether you're talking about simply the Jesus as, as portrayed in, in the Gospels. Um, I mean, I, I'll be the last person to say there's not some good, wise, sage advice, for instance, in the Sermon on the Mount, but there's... There's a lot more to the picture of of Jesus, and you know he's not uh, he's not a sage for everyone, and he's also a he's also a sage very specific to his own time, mm. um, and so I, I encourage everybody to 
you know, not whitewash uh, what you're what you're reading in the gospel simply because it's 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 a little bit rough around the edges. But yeah, as as one of our earlier super chats made the remark in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus doesn't seem like a very nice dude, and he's not doing a lot of sharing and caring. Um, and you know, I, I think it's great that Christianity uh, that that Christians are are motivated ethically to to be like Jesus, but you know, that's a certain that's a certain version of Jesus. And I, I think it's great to say Jesus loves you, but um, there's also another side. Uh, and we need to uh, look at the whole picture. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate the super chat. Seriously. Constellation Pegasus. Barakat 6A is weird. Burning cats' guts to see demons. Was that written in medieval times? I don't know how to track down when that was written. They weren't doing that in Second Temple Judaism, were they? Well, it depends. So Barakot is a is a tractate in rabbinic literature, but there's there's multiple versions of Barakot. So there's the Mishnah, uh, is the first sort of version of Barakot, and that's written in the late second century, uh, in the Galilee. And, but then you have the Tosefta um, and the, the Palestinian Talmud has a version, expanded version of Barakot and also then the Babylonian Talmud. And the Babylonian Talmud is, is, is quite late. Uh, it's, it's the fullest uh, indication of, or fullest presentation of Barakot. Mm. So I'm not sure what you're reading, but if, if you're reading the Babylonian Talmud, version of Barakot, that's going to be 6th century Babylon. So that's that's quite late, but it's not medieval. And the question of uh, these sorts of domestic rituals, which some have called magic, were these part of Judaism? Well, you can check out uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls and see lots of instances of astrology. And I, I recommend uh, getting a copy of the Greek magical papyri is a translation edited by Hans Dieter Betz in which we see lots of these ceremonies and Jews and Jewish names and Jewish deities all mixed in. So I think it's pretty clear that, you know, although an official religion might want to present itself as not doing these kinds of rituals, it's absolutely the case that when you're talking about the religion of everyday exchange mm -hmm. and the religion on the ground, absolutely, Jews and peoples of all kinds would be involved in these sorts of what I'll call domestic rituals, which are interacting with lower beings, not demons, but daimones, that is lower divinities who aren't necessarily evil, but simply lower than the high God. Thank you, Constellation. I appreciate your super chat. Good to see you here. Abel Chavez, Jesus is the Antichrist. Paul is the false prophet. What if the Bible somehow is meant to be read backwards? Also, I have read into a theory that the Bible is how cabal run the world. <laughs> it is not history, rather a platform. Well, that's it. It's an interesting counter reading. It's a, it's a very Gnostic reading of, of the the Bible, and you, you could absolutely take it that way. I mean, I tend to think that as important as the Bible is, um, it, it, is it, isn't, uh, <laughs> it isn't that important uh, for, for politicians. I think, you know, Trump may hold up a copy of the, of the Bible, uh, but really, I don't think he knows what's inside it. So I'm, I'm not sure uh, <laughs> how much it's running the world. But it's definitely in influential, and I, I think that, you know, again, I, as Derek said earlier, a balanced reading, a balanced historical reading of this material is really the the best way forward. You know, you don't have to hate or love the Bible in order to uh, pursue it historically mm -hmm. and understand really what's going on. Um, you can be a critical reader without necessarily trying to debunk or disprove something. 
Uh, and maybe Jesus does it for you, uh, and maybe not, but uh, it, you can go elsewhere, you know, and have an eclectic kind of approach. So, yeah, uh, I would really encourage uh, Abel to, yeah, read some of the, the Gnostic literature, which uh, sort of transforms the Bible uh, in a way that you're describing. So texts like the Secret Book of John or the Apocryphon of John uh, in the Nagamati Library are doing uh, sort of this, I, this uh, the Gospel of Judas. Um, these are texts where you might actually see this approach in the ancient world. Abel, thank you for the super chat, my friend. Casper Clements, even if you had the whole Bible and nothing else, you couldn't reconstruct Christian belief, culture, and practice. That's really true, actually, and that's a nice insight. I mean, the Protestant mythology is that their their ritual and cultic practice is all based on the Bible, but that's not true at all. It's, I mean, if you go to an American megachurch, it's it's mostly. I mean, the, the ritual, the, the singing, the choirs, uh, the, the organ, the bands, uh, the sermon. I mean, none of that's in the Bible. All of that is a historical product of evolution. And a lot of it, I mean, comes from, you know, now, I guess, business practices. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know. <laughs> Joel uh, Olstein, happy, happy. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing in the Bible that says, you know, you must have a sermon and you you should have a choir and a band and you should use an organ or, you know, <laughs> I mean, it says nothing really almost about the nature of music. So all, all of Christian culture and, and liturgy is, is something that is generated through time. And there's nothing in the there's nothing prescribing in the Bible about what those is and and you you can go to a church and see 15 different presentations of the eucharist or the lord's supper ritual and all of them are radically different uh and yeah all that we have from the bible is the words of institution <laughs> you know this is my body and uh really you know the christians take it from there i mean there's nothing there's nothing really uh stable there at all <laughs> Thank you, Casper, for the super chat. Couple more here, and then uh, I want to try and get people. If we can get someone, someone to sign up for Doctor Litwa's uh, Patreon, we're at the end of the month, and I always have this tradition with Doctor Litwa where I like to try and get people to join to help him do this more often. Are you giving away books, by the way, for people who join certain tiers still? Or, well, definitely, yeah. So I believe it's tier five. Uh, a lot of the books. Um, are on the expensive side because they're from academic publishers but i can get uh i put discount codes and promo codes on the patreon okay. and i will also send you the book myself at a discounted rate if they go like the number five or yeah if they join a tier five and basically since i'm from australia it does cost me a fair amount for shipping but right. Uh, once shipping is paid for, I can send it to you directly. If you want it signed, I can sign it and, uh, you know, go to town. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, in, in some cases, like with the book Desiring Divinity or, or with the book The Evil Creator, you're going to oh, get it. You're going to get book. it cheaper by going through me than you are going to get it from Amazon. You're um, you're dealing with source material. This is why I really love your work, because I'm you can't go. I mean, with what we have, that's the furthest back to the evidence you can get. And you're dealing with source material throughout. Um, please, I'm going to check to see how many patrons. I hope we get at least one or two joining him by the end of this episode. He traveled all the way from Australia to come here and do the courses with me so that we can bring you the mysteries in a scholarly college course package and stuff. I, I, I suspect we'll figure out a, a promo code too for people who join the Patreon who want to get the courses as well. We'll figure out that together. Excellent. So yeah, good idea. Yeah. We'll figure out a way to, to work that out for Patreon members who, who are interested. So on both yours and mine, but I want to check this and, and hopefully we can get some people to help join. All right. Um, native atheist, you had tragedies not too long ago, Derek. Thank you for these scholars. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah, it hasn't been the smoothest road, but you know, you got to keep driving and 
you got to keep going no matter what and do what you feel is right in your gut, in your conscious. You know, you just got to you just got to do what you got to do and keep moving forward. And I wasn't ever going to stop doing what I'm doing here. So I really appreciate the support and uh, being a member as well. Remember, your sins are forgiven, my friend. <laughs> Anyone who's a member, they're like, it's the blood of Mephishan that washes away their sins. So they're totally clean. Thank you so much, Native Atheist. Uh, Jason Sobeck is back. What are your thoughts on the Celine Lily? Yeah, Lily's thesis that the assault of Eve in what is this? R O R O O T W and reality of the rulers uh, on the origin of the world and apocryphal of John. Okay, commentary and inversion on Roman imperial rhetoric. Have you read? Well, that? I I think probably. Thanks, Jason. By the way, I I think it's probably safe to say that a lot of what you're going to see in these Gnostic texts, and, and these are highly recommended, uh, these are all introduced on my Patreon, The Nature or Reality of the Rulers, The Origin of the World, and The Apocryphon of John. If you haven't read these, these are going to knock your socks off. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they are surprisingly like satires on the biblical text uh, in Genesis. And they contain I mean, I mean, just to give you one example, which Jason may be thinking of, Yahweh, the Jewish God, rapes Eve or tries to rape Eve. And then from Eve is born Cain and Abel. And that's why Cain and Abel are deformed. Uh, one has, uh, I, I love this image, <laughs> one has the head of a cat. Uh, <laughs> what? Uh, but it, it, it's wild stuff. And so it's also, I think you could describe it as, as anti-imperial because, you know, one of the things that early Christians were struggling with is authority and, you know, the authority that they knew they lived in a, in a fascist state, a, a, a dictatorship. I mean, for as, 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 as much as people like glorify the Roman emperors, they were Italian dictators and this is the world that they lived in. And in that world, you had every right to be suspicious of authority. Like many people are today, uh, you were in a world where, yeah, the rulers got away with pretty much everything. And there was no national or international media, you know, actually keeping track of, of people and exposing them. Uh, this was the world that they lived in. It's a highly abusive world. And so, you know, when you see Christians writing stories about, you know, the the God of this world, um, whether that be the Jewish uh, deity or uh, some somebody else, um, in fact, being evil and abusive and running sort of like a mafia enterprise, that you definitely can read that as as anti-imperial, um, and and I, I think that that's a completely valid reading. Um, although I would encourage everyone, I mean, you, you can never read an ancient text as if it's a clear window into, into reality. They're always, but, but, but everybody comes from a certain social and political context. So absolutely we can take an anti-imperial reading of those texts. So thanks, Jason. Thank you so much. Just a few more here. And then I'm going to take this banner down. We're going to check to make sure Fingers crossed. We have somebody joining tier five, hopefully. Oh, God above God. <laughs> but anyway, joining period. Joining period. I want to try I don't and know get tier five. <laughs> I'm gonna step those numbers up. Uh, no, but seriously, you're doing wonderful work. So I, I just hope that uh, we can get it. Because here's the thing: it's not. I'm not pushing people to do something. A lot of people don't even know. Uh -huh. See, this is the problem I'm finding with the internet world: is a lot of people don't even know how they can help. They don't know what they can do. And so I make sure that it. Like, you don't walk away and go, well, what, what, what was that? No, 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 no. You knew what I'm saying. You know, you, you, you're catching what I'm picking up or putting down you're picking up. So I, I just want people to know how they can get more of this because there's so more. I mean, so much more. When, they, when I read your evil creator, I was blown away. I was just like, what the heck? How come I never heard of any of this? Like, literally any of it. No one has ever told me any of this stuff. And here you are in this book just blowing me away showing images of things too it wasn't just text i was just like what the heck is it so anyway uh thank you so much for that 
Jason, Lord of the Four Corners. Constellation Pegasus, thank you again, my friend, for the super chat. It's hard for me to research this Bible stuff anymore. I despise being an atheist now, being lied to from the damned Jehovah's Witnesses, and seeing Bible contradictions now. I'm irritated looking into this stuff anymore. Shame. Yeah, I think this is where a lot of people are in terms of their intellectual uh, and, and spiritual journeys, or, or just in terms of, you know, they've been very, very hurt. And because that there is this trauma in, in your life that has been generated from, uh, you know, your religious upbringing or, or whatever it is that you've gone through, that it's hard to come back to this material. But what I would urge everyone is what you're learning in, in if you've gone to Sunday school or you've been raised in a certain sect or church, whether it be Christian or not Christian, you're always learning a tradition that has been an interpretation mm -hmm. that has been placed over the Bible. And the Bible never says anything. It's people who say that it says something. And some people have convinced whole communities that, you know, the Bible says things. And some of the things are awful. You know, I mean, the anti-gay stuff uh, it, it has been terrible. Uh, I mean, this stuff about male superiority and, and only male leadership, it's been a, a cultural uh, nuclear bomb. I mean, it, it's, it's awful. Um, and yes, these religious insiders have convinced themselves that that's what the Bible says. But keep in mind, the Bible never says anything. It's people who are in power who say what the Bible says, but they have no more power than you do to approach this material, which doesn't say just one thing. Mm -hmm. It says many things. And, you know, so, and you may not be, you know, just, you may not be able right now to approach this material again, to start afresh without any of these rotten assumptions and frameworks that have been imposed on the Bible. Mm. But give yourself time, create some distance. And this is what's great and redemptive about scholarship, because scholarship creates that distance from the Bible, because scholarship is not about, you know, proving this wrong or right. Mm -hmm. It's it's about what was going on really 20 <laughs> centuries ago. And you know, just trying to figure out what was going on on the ground. And it's because we don't want to prove something that it's it, it becomes redemptive. We're distant. You know, whatever it is that we find, we're not we're not invested in it in the same way that we were. And yeah, we don't have to twist anybody's arm or convince anything of, of any of anything, anyone of anything, because it's all about who's got better evidence and arguments and about submitting to the evidence and following that with our heart and mm. not just, you know, hearing apologists and anti-apologists try to convince us of one thing or another. So yeah, take your time, get that distance. And if it's right at some point to return to this material, do so. But when you do find the best stuff, don't, don't just, you know, do a YouTube search or go to, yeah. you know, your local Christian library. You're definitely going to end up the same place where you did before. You want to listen to Derek, hear the scholars that he's bringing on, get the recommended reading and go find that material. Join the Patreon of real scholars who are giving their time and energy to people to help them in their yeah. journeys we as a human race were on a quest and there is wisdom there and yeah you can make use of that as human wisdom and but it is that's all that it is it's it's a human product and we've got to deal with that and go forward on that basis and not fall into the trap of just 
thinking that what a tradition says is what is actually the truth. Abel Chavez, is the Bible written by the victors? If so, then would this not make a big difference and more credible as opposed to being given by so-called angels and God? This is what I meant by platform or blueprint. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, most of the Bible is written by Jewish people and uh, Jew some of those Jewish people became followers of Jesus. I mean, in some sense, the Jewish people aren't aren't the victors. Um, in many ways, they became the victims. And so some of the literature is really processing, you know, why it is that we have been so, that is the Jewish people and later on uh, the Christians, why we are so insignificant and oppressed and uh, feeling like powerless. And what do you do with that? Well, out of that feeling of powerlessness and inferiority, you can have uh, creativity emerge out of that. But of course, you know, in, in the traditions, you know, when, when Christianity be, goes from a small cult group to uh, a state religion, then the people in power, yes, are absolutely the victors and they use the Bible as a, as a weapon. They weaponize the Bible and that weaponization of the Bible definitely uh, is, is going on today, you know, on all sorts of Christian radio and, and television. You know, it's, it's being weaponized to say, you know, say things that it cannot possibly have said, you mm -hmm. know, uh, I, uh, on the recent debate in abortion. I mean, when the Bible was written, um, we, we just didn't have the technology. We didn't, we really didn't imagine a situation where, you know, people who got pregnant could, you know, they couldn't go to the doctor's office and, uh, you know, and, and safely take care of, or make a decision. A woman couldn't make a decision. Uh, and, you know, so it, in a sense, if you're using the Bible to talk about modern issues that are in, informed by technology and saying, you know, that life begins at conception, well, you can use Bible passages to try to prove that, but that's not really what they were intended to do in, in, the, in the first place. That wasn't even a philosophical issue. So, it's it's the again it's the interpretation of those in power trying to convince you that you know this is what this is what the Bible says. Uh, yeah, you you don't need to believe that that the Bible was divinely inspired to have it be impactful uh, for your for your life. Um, uh, I I believe that this is the the one liberating moment to see that. You know, these are ancient people that still speaking to us, but they they were ancient people and they belong to a culture that was entirely different than what our own is. They lived in a world without any of the technologies, you know, that we often take for granted. They lived in a world in which philosophy and government was completely different. And the basic assumptions about what human life was and why we were here is all different. Mm -hmm. And so when you when you see that these people are people and we're all on this on this journey, we don't need to throw away this material, but we can we can gain wisdom from it. But let's never be so arrogant just to say, you know, this is what the Bible says. Right. That's that's never really the case. That's not that's never easy to determine. And if somebody says, you know, this is a map or a blueprint or this gives us all the answers to all our modern questions, it doesn't, folks. And please don't expect it to. I mean, this is a product <laughs> written, you know, anywhere from, you know, 2,500 years ago to uh, 1,900 years ago. What do you expect from this sort of, of literature? It, this isn't, this isn't going to answer modern questions. Uh, but you can still gain wisdom from it. And uh, I hope that, yeah, you can gain the distance so that you can still be benefited and liberated by understanding more of this material. Thank you, Abel. And Constellation Pegasus said, thanks. I'll keep that in mind. 
when we responded. <laughs> so thank you so much for that. The whole function of the Patreon is is just to make me more available as a teacher. So whenever you feel like you're ready to take these particular courses, and they are college level courses, college level material, to take that extra mile, I really appreciate anybody and everybody who who wants to take that journey with me. So definitely no pressure now. Um, and uh, I just want to thank everybody for, for showing up. Love the chase and the hunt, and I set the pace when I'm running. I always take what I want, and I always give it 100.